Welcome back to another edition of Between Two Fars. I'm Warnicky Miller, and I've been talking with Brian Stanford. We have just gone through all of the differences in dealing with the litigation in front of the GAO and litigation in front of COFSI, but we wanted to pause and talk a little bit about the dynamics of an agency attorney working with a DOJ attorney on the same case. If you've never done this before, you really do need to kind of have a big picture view of how these interactions work. And we are very lucky to have Brian here who can just talk to us a little bit about the things you need to keep in mind as you engage with DOJ. Brian, what would you suggest to that attorney who's just recognized that they're gonna be working with the DOJ attorney? Absolutely, Warnicky. It's um, it's a really important topic, uh, especially if you uh, have been as agency counsel first chair on a protest at GAO that finds its way to the court, um, and you are now all of a sudden going to be working very, very closely uh, with your DOJ counterpart who is going to assume the first chair responsibilities for that bid protest when it goes to the court. Uh, and you know, then your previous role as first chair um, kind of evaporates and you become kind of a second chair uh, supporting role to that to that attorney. Now, the the particulars of that relationship, um, you know, I think are case specific. They're attorney specific, uh, and they're going to depend a lot on who you're dealing with over there at DOJ. Uh, but it, it's really important, above all, to make sure that you um, you know foster that relationship from 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 Jump Street. Uh, really, um, you know, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, and, and get on uh, as good a terms as you can with the DOJ attorney uh, because, uh, again, you're going to be working with them really closely. And these DOJ attorneys, depending on who you are assigned um, through that national court section, they're going to have their own uh, practice philosophies, um, you know, and working styles, uh, above all, theories of, of your case, uh, the, you know, the merits of, of the, the protest decision uh, that you are. Uh, you know, uh, for procurements that you are now after a round of uh, uh, of GAO protests are intimately familiar with, um, <laughs> and I think fairly uh, have a significant amount of ownership of, of those of those cases. So, um, what we've seen is sometimes, um, you know, uh, well, oftentimes DOJ attorneys are coming in at a significant informational disadvantage, uh, and uh, they also are sometimes more reticent to share. Uh, their thoughts on strategy, uh, and and and, uh, and sometimes we see they're they're hesitant to like venture certain arguments uh, or uh, litigate record disputes, uh, for instance. Hmm. And so, um, you know, it's important to uh, it, it's a it, I think it's a relationship um, where you 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 uh, are helping that DOJ attorney get up to speed very quickly, uh, supporting in every way that you possibly can, but also. Um, hopefully earning that respect and trust to where you can have those healthy debates uh, about those particular issues. So, um, you know, these attorneys are going to rely very heavily on agency counsel, especially uh, with record um, uh, formulation uh, and to, again, explain the intricacies of the procurement, the evaluation processes. Obviously, we deal with some very uh, complicated contracts, uh, some very in-depth uh, complicated procurements. Uh, and so having to educate uh, a new lawyer on the scene uh, with very little time to get kind of spooled up on an issue uh, is really important. Um, so it's it's uh, it's critical that you have a close working relationship with them, uh, uh, f you know, f from from the get go uh, and to stay engaged with them, uh, ask them to assist with briefs, uh, review their work product, right? They're kind of they are the agency's lawyer now. Um, and and so you want to make sure that um, you're working very closely with them to make sure that the arguments they're putting forward uh, are really the best characterization, in your opinion, of um, the, uh, the the litigating position that you want the uh, the the agency and the government to take. Do you have any tips for that agency attorney to get the DOJ attorney up to speed? Is that best done verbally, or are you giving them? Uh, some briefs from the GAO, or are you giving them a, a new summary that you've just written? What's the best way to sort of initially engage and get them the facts they need? Yeah, it's it's typically, um, you know, uh, it we we get wind from DOJ, right? That a um, 
there's a there's a the protester is required to uh, do a pre filing notice that a bid protest is coming. So we do have some interstitial time there. The Department of Justice does to learn more about the case before the actual complaint is filed. And so what we've seen is uh, it's really effective to get the DOJ uh, the de the decision, obviously, in the GAO and the briefs uh, in the GAO case, if the if the case was at uh, the GAO before, uh, you know th that those are really good um, uh, primers for for the DOJ to get um, uh, understanding the the um, you know the contracting officer statement of facts, really giving a good overview of the procurement, uh, what happened factually, what the legal arguments were at the GAO, because more often than not. Um, uh, you know, different iterations of the same kind of core uh, legal issues will uh, get raised at at COFC. So it's important to get those initial documents over to the DOJ immediately. And then what we find is uh, you're on the phone uh, or, you know, just virtually meeting with the DOJ attorney to start answering questions and uh, simultaneously starting to put the record together for the DOJ attorney uh, and talking about strategy on uh, whether or not you, the agency is going to want to voluntarily stay performance or not. That's another. Um, uh, yeah, we discussed that a few episodes ago, all of the factors that go into that decision. And yeah. have you found any ways to, uh, I don't know, best articulate the agency's desire in, in that respect? What, any any tips for being effective in that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, that's um, it's a that's a tough one uh, because in our experience, you know, again, we we're we're lawyers. We know what the standard is, uh, but the DOJ and, I, and they're going to tell you this. These lawyers are going to tell you this. Like, we know what the standard is on paper, but we know how it actually works, right? So, like, yes. if you're at a TRO or preliminary injunction, if you want to, fight, you know, the agency wants to fight it so that they can continue performance. You know, let's say for instance, we have a critical spaceflight program. We've already gone through 100 plus days of having an automatic stay. Uh, we want to get going. Uh, there is a you know a critical uh, spaceflight issue uh, that is going to um, you know not be resolved if the agency has to continue staying performance. Uh, you know a lot of pressure from the client on the agency side to do that. Uh, you know the, the the we as the NASA lawyers know legally right like the standard for preliminary preliminary injunction is. We, I think, highly deferential to the agency. The burden is on the protester in order to be able to meet those factors, those enumerated factors. Uh, but you know, the DOJ, we find categorically, uh, you know, that they're of the position that well, we know how these judges operate. We know that it's a it's a balancing test among the factors, but it's really going to come down to likelihood of success on the merits. And if the protester has anything that resembles a colorable claim. Uh, DOJ is, is really concerned, uh, 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 rightfully so, that the court's going to rule in their favor, notwithstanding how those other factors are going to pan out for or against the agency. And and G DOJ isn't usually sympathetic to those arguments about impact to mission. I mean, it really has to be life or property uh, to really start to sway the, the DOJ, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, whether or not that's a compelling enough case to move forward. Um, and and they don't, you know, our experience is DOJ may not want to really wade into the merits of a complicated case at a preliminary injunction um, stage uh, because it could open a Pandora's box. And depending on the judge, you know, we could get bogged down in merits uh, that in the context of a preliminary injunction fight that take away valuable resources from actually litigating the merits and could color, you know, the merits uh, mm -hmm. if we had otherwise presented them. Uh, you know, fresh at the uh, at the actual pleading stage. So, uh, and if we get a, an adverse ruling from the judge, uh, it's it's uh, m makes the case just more difficult to uh, to plead. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there is a strategic consideration that well, if you have a read from the judge on the merits, you'll be able to uh, you know sharpen your arguments and direct the judge uh, you know on a particular issue to a place where you think the uh, um, you know, the issue is more compelling in your favor. So. Fantastic. These are some excellent points to keep in mind as you're engaging with your G DOJ attorney. We really appreciate your insight, Brian, and thank you for the time that you have given to us in helping us with these knowledge capture videos. Thank you. I we'll really see you all it. again back here next time on Between Two Fars. <laughs>